All right, here we go. Uh, Book of Job, uh, Faithful Living in Times of Crisis. This is lesson number eight in our series. One more to go after this one. Uh, the uh, the uh, uh, title of our lesson tonight uh, is Life Lessons from Job. And what we, uh, what we said at the beginning was that uh, we would study the entire book and then uh, save for uh, the final lessons uh, some of the life lessons, the things that we've uh, learned uh, from Job. So we've completed a brief thematic study uh, of the uh, book of Job. And uh, I say thematic uh, and not textual because we have not had uh, a kind of a line by line type uh, class, uh, which would have taken much longer than uh, the few weeks that uh, we've devoted to uh, our study. Uh, instead, we followed an outline based on the theme, faithful living in times of crisis. So in this way, we've uh, become familiar with uh, Job's story and we focused on this man's reaction to his, uh, to his difficult experience, or should I say, the operation of his faith through various trials. How did this man's uh, faith uh, operate as he negotiated various trials, well, what we have said, crises. Briefly stated, Job was a, um, a righteous man in God's eyes, and uh, he was allowed to undergo a variety of trials initiated by Satan, but permitted and limited by God. Uh, and all of this done in order to demonstrate Job's rightness and faithfulness. Added to uh, his uh, financial and family and health losses were the accusations from his friends uh, that he himself was responsible for bringing all of these catastrophes upon himself because of secret or unrepentant sin. And so we observe Job as he uh, faces three major crises. The first one, a physical crisis, where he loses his wealth and family and health, and he accepts what happens to him as God's will, and he submits to it, uh, to it uh, with his faith intact. And we, we read that famous uh, verse, chapter one, verse 21, he said, naked I came from my mother's womb, and naked I shall return there. The Lord gave and the Lord has taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. A kind of a high point in Job's uh, experience. And then uh, we uh, you know, studied uh, the part where Job goes through a theological crisis. In other words, his friends encourage him to repent of his sin, which according to the thinking of the day was the cause of his misery. And this caused a theological you know, crisis in his life. Job also believed in this law of retribution where you were blessed uh, or you were cursed by God based on your relative uh, righteousness. Um, this may have been Job's secret sin that he, you know, he trusted that his righteousness was the reason for his uh, former wealth and all the blessings that he had. This of course, causes his second and more serious crisis, his theology no longer lined up with his life experience. You know, he's thinking, wait a minute, I'm a righteous man, God blesses righteous men, but I'm suffering all of these hardships. You know, there's something wrong here, there's, there's, uh, you know, there's a contradiction going on here. And this was the substance of his theological crisis. So he manages to successfully debate his friends to a draw, uh, but this glaring inconsistency pushes him to consider that God may have other reasons for using personal suffering in the life of an otherwise faithful and righteous man. So we don't see any growth of thought or growth, you know, spiritual development among his friends, but we do see some growth in Job's thinking. You know, he begins to think, well, maybe God has other ways of you know, working uh, with uh, individuals. And then of course, um, his, um, uh, his uh, third crisis, which is 
his spiritual crisis. Uh, this realization, you know, that maybe God works in different ways, this realization leads him to his final crisis, which is a personal encounter with God who questions both his knowledge and his power as a man in comparison to God's knowledge and power you know, as the divine being. And we see from this encounter that Job's true sin was that he was uh, uh, attempting to bring God down to his own level. Uh, he did this when he not only questioned God's justice, but he demanded a trial where he would debate his case with God, just as he had debated his friends and refuted their arguments. And we see uh, you know, in, the, in the book that Job is, you know, is, is uh, you know, pacing about saying, boy, if God were here, if he'd only show up in front of me, I would make my case, I would win my case, you know, I would debate him. Uh, so there was a certain amount of pride uh, going on uh, in his demand that God appear before him uh, and answer for himself, uh, if you wish. And so after being face to face with God, however, he recognizes the great difference between himself and God. He repents and God forgives and then restores Job and also his three friends. And so that's pretty much the story. That's what we studied in the last several weeks. And I said in this, well, this is the second to last lesson, we would draw some lessons from what we have learned from Job. And here are seven, count them, <laughs> seven lessons uh, from the book of Job. Here they are, lesson number one. God is great. I mean, that has to be lesson number one. God is great. Job's sin and the lesson that he learned was that the greatness of his God far surpassed what Job originally thought or imagined. You know, people rarely, if ever, overestimate God or what uh, he can do. Our problem, like Job, is thinking that God uh, is you know, simply a better version of ourselves. Uh, you know, small faith has a small God, but biblical faith believes in the God who created all and sustains all and will transform all when Jesus returns. And so lesson number one, God is great. Uh, you could say it in reverse, you know, that uh, many times our problem is we think that God is too small. You know, we bring him down to our level, but God is great. That's lesson number one. Lesson number two from Job, our strength um, is in God and not ourselves. Um, as the psalmist says in Psalm 28, the Lord is my strength and my shield. And so Job's faith found a way to persevere because it was fixed on God and not upon himself. Paul the Apostle had to learn the very same lesson through suffering as well. We read about that in 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse nine, where you know, the Lord puts a thorn in his flesh to teach, him that, to teach him that lesson. Job's faith allowed him to express his emotions to God who was strong enough to receive these emotions. And he said some pretty harsh things, but God you know, is big enough to take whatever we, can, whatever we can give him. Strength in God builds a faith that can trust him even in the darkest moments. And as I read before, we need to, uh, you know, our motto, if you wish, our uh, fallback position should be that the Lord is my strength and my shield in times of uh, difficulty, because our strength is in God and not uh, in, our, in ourselves. Lesson number three. Lesson number three is your faith works only when you work your faith. Your faith works only when you work your faith. You know, we note at the beginning, before he faced all of the crises, Job practiced those things that built a strong faith. Things like righteous living and faithful worship and benevolence. 
he was doing all these things while he was healthy, while he was rich, while everything was going well. He was practicing the things of his faith. He was working his faith. And so when the storms came, his faith held. You know, soldiers, they train while there is no war so that they are ready when the war does come. And in this world, the war always comes. In the very same way, we train and we strengthen our faith while there is peace so that when the storm comes, and it will, our faith is fully functional and strong because we've been working at it. Remember that trials of any kind can cause us to lose or worse, consciously abandon our faith. We just, we just give it up. A very sick child or a very sick spouse, a sudden loss of income or a job. Uh, perhaps we face changes in where we live or, or how we live for a variety of reasons. Uh, broken families, uh, many people have legal problems, constant immoral behavior by ourselves or others that we are close to. These and, and other trials constantly battering us will cause fatigue and discouragement and anger and resentment and, and despair in anyone, no matter how strong their faith might be. We let ourselves go spiritually when things like this begin to take place. We develop an attitude that says, well, if God doesn't care, why should I care? And this is where a well-trained faith can naturally switch from kind of manual drive to automatic in order to fly you through the storm on, on autopilot uh, as, it, as it were. That kind of faith is, is what you cultivate in the easy and the sunny days of life by cultivating good spiritual habits of daily prayer and Bible study and regular worship and, and, and enthusiastic service to the Lord while the times are good. Because sooner or later in anyone's life, everyone's life, the times become difficult and our faith many times has to switch over to automatic to keep us going. And so, our faith works only when we are working our faith. Lesson number four from Job, be still, be still. Psalm 46.10 says, be still and know that I am God. I love that. Be still and know that I am God. You don't learn anything while you're thrashing about spiritually. Note that Job's wife was exasperated with him. Do something, she was saying, more or less saying to him. Even if it's cursing God and ending your life, do something. But the spiritual man or the spiritual woman's first response to crisis is stillness, not action. Stillness, not action. We think we have to do something. We think we have to make something happen. We think we have to change things around in order to you know, uh, overcome. When many times the very step that we need to take is to simply be still and let God do his work. Let God uh, begin to operate uh, in our lives. And so the fourth lesson from Job, be still, be still. Lesson number five, realize that no one really knows how it feels. <laughs> this is so important emotionally. Realize that no one really knows how it feels. You know, each person's suffering is unique even if some of the details are similar to somebody else's experience or suffering. You know, one of Job's frustrations was that his friends assumed that they knew exactly what he was going through and they knew exactly why he was suffering and, and, and they knew how to make things right. You know, when you're the one undergoing the trial, 
save your energy in trying to explain how it feels or what the experience is like, since aside from the comfort derived from you know, venting, getting somebody else to actually understand doesn't solve anything. I mean, I know it's, it, it may be comforting to think that somebody really understands and really gets it, but that doesn't solve anything. So many people invest so much energy, spiritual and emotional and physical, in trying to get people to understand how they feel, thinking that if somebody else understands how they feel, it'll somehow resolve the issue, and it doesn't. It doesn't. And most of the time, people don't really know what it's like. Very much like Job, we should direct these type of efforts to God, who does know and who can help relieve our, our suffering. Lesson number six, sometimes you don't know and you will never know why. Not always, but sometimes it happens that you never get the answer, why did this happen? Even though in the end, God faced and spoke to Job, he corrected him, he forgave him, he even restored him to health and wealth and prosperity and happiness and all that. He never revealed to Job the reason for his suffering and Job was wise enough not to ask. You don't always have to know the why in order to heal properly and to move on successfully. Job didn't and yet he lived a happy and full life after this terrible episode in his life. Heaven will not be for remembering or finding closure for earthly trials. Heaven will be for experiencing the awesome presence of God without the restrictions of sin and doubt. I hear people saying, boy, when I get to heaven, I'm going to ask, you know, uh, how did Uncle Joe really die? You know, did he drown or did he trip or did he have a heart attack? You know, I really want to know that. Or, uh, when we get to heaven, uh, God's finally going to tell me why you know, the baby died of cancer or you know, why I had to lose my job in the middle of everything and so on and so on. You know, we think that in heaven, we're going to look back and we're going to get all the reasons for stuff that happened here on earth and no. Heaven is not going to be for looking back on earth and dissecting the, you know, the, the, the outer workings of sin in our lives. Heaven will be to take in the wonderfulness of, of God. Knowing the why will not be a need when we will be glorified and exalted to the right hand of God with Jesus Christ. We won't care about the whys of the things here on earth. We will be too consumed with the now, with the glorious presence of God, with the uh, uh, never ending knowledge uh, and increasing knowledge of, of God uh, without the restriction of sin uh, in our lives. And then finally, uh, lesson number seven. God often uses crisis to bless us spiritually. Not just, you know, we often say <clears throat> God uses crisis to make us grow. That's true and that's an obvious lesson, but he also does it to bless us spiritually. It is usually after a crisis of some kind in our lives that we gain a greater understanding of God and his nature and his power and his ways. After a blessing, I am reminded of the things that I already know about God. You know, God blesses me and I'm reminded of his kindness and his generosity for which I repeatedly give thanks. However, it is during a crisis or during a trial that I usually discover something that I didn't know about God. 
For example, I have learned and I was amazed at how God sees to all the small details of answered prayer. And I only learned that during a time of suffering and actually during a very long period of suffering. You know, Lise and I, we prayed for help with the recent move, uh, but in answering that prayer, I noted the assistance and the blessings that we received in every aspect of that move. You know, selling our house, buying another house, financing, moving, setting things up. I realized that God is the God of detail. I mean, you look at the world that he's created, the detail in which the world is created. And I often see, uh, especially during times of crisis, the detail uh, in the answered prayer that God uh, 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 makes uh, on my behalf. And so regardless of the trial or the challenge, God rewards faithfulness with both material and spiritual rewards. You see, Job, he suffered greatly, but his constant, not perfect, but his constant faith was ultimately rewarded, not with the why of his situation, but rather a greater understanding and appreciation of the who. He found out not about the why, he found out more about the who, who God really was and what God was really like. Now, in addition to the seven lessons that we learned from Job, and of course, obviously, these are not the only lessons, but these are seven that I chose. I'd like to provide you with a kind of an emergency first aid kit to help you should you ever find yourself facing either a physical, a theological, or a spiritual crisis. So here's a spiritual emergency first aid kit in case of physical crisis, theological crisis, or spiritual crisis. Here we go. Here's your spiritual emergency first aid kit in case of physical crisis. In case of physical crisis, be still. Stop crying out. Stop trying to explain. Just doing these things will begin to stabilize the crisis itself. And so in case of physical crisis, again, be still. Stop crying out. Stop explaining. Number two, in case of theological crisis, say and do what you know is true, not what you think is best. Not what you think is going to get you out of the situation, not what you think is going to resolve everything. Say and do what you know is true. Humble yourself and begin to listen more than you speak. So there's the emergency, you know, the spiritual emergency kit. If you find yourself in a theological crisis, say what is true, humble yourself, start listening. And then number three, spiritual emergency kit, in case you find yourself in a spiritual crisis, First of all, believe God's word only. If you're in a spiritual crisis, listen and believe to God's word only because there'll be a lot of voices and a lot of input and a lot of things going on if you're in a spiritual crisis. Make sure you, you laser in only on God's word and listen to that and believe that only. And then remember Cardinal Leger as an example. Now that may mean nothing to you, unless perhaps you were a Catholic and you were growing up in Quebec in the 50s, which I was, 
So I want to tell you the story of Cardinal Leger. Cardinal Leger, Paul Emile Leger, was a high official in the Roman Catholic Church. He was a cardinal. I mean, you know, in the hierarchy of things, you know, in the Catholic Church, you have the Pope at the top and then you have cardinals. That's the second you know, highest position in the Catholic Church. Okay. So Cardinal Leger, he was in a very high position in the Catholic Church. He lived like a privileged prince. Uh, he knew the teachings and the laws and the rituals of the Catholic Church. He was the cardinal responsible for the province of Quebec where I lived as a, a child and as a young man. And that's where cardinals do. They're responsible for large geographical uh, areas and the local bishops and priests and other clergymen in the Catholic Church, you know, they kind of report to him. All right. So this man uh, uh, lived, uh, and I remember the place where he lived, I mean, it was like a palace. You know, he, had a, he had a chauffeur that drove him around, he wore the vestments, uh, he, he lived like a prince. But he had a spiritual crisis in his life. He had a calling to serve, uh, and he began to search the Bible for what was true what was from Christ, what was absolutely blessed by God, irregardless of denomination or de doctrinal position or you know, the clerical position, you know, what, what position as a clergyman he held. You know, he, he didn't look in the, the Catholic books or things like that. He looked in the Bible to see you know, what, what exactly what was God calling him to. And so after a time of reflection, he willingly chose to leave his position as cardinal in the Roman Catholic Church, and he traveled to Africa, to Cameroon, to work and to live with a leper colony there. I don't mean he lived like in a palace and every once in a while, you know, drove down the hill to the leper colony. He lived with the lepers and he ministered to them and helped them and taught them and so on and so forth. And so he, he, he willingly chose to do this thing. So here was a top level leader of the Catholic Church who did what he was sure of theologically and that was to love and serve the sick and the poor in the name of Jesus. Do you see the point I'm trying to make here? The point about listen carefully to what the word says. He was absolutely positive that going to love and serve and minister to the, the poorest of the poor in Africa, those who were abandoned and rejected by society in Africa, that this was certainly something that would be approved of by Jesus Christ. He was absolutely positive theologically that this was true, that this was good, that this was pleasing in God's sight. So my point with this is when in doubt, do what you are absolutely sure that God's word teaches. Remember, Cardinal Leger. Well, just a final word here about the trials and the sufferings of this world, which we all share at one time or another, and to a lesser degree uh, and extent than, than other people at times. All of it will be forgotten when Jesus comes. You know, all the things you're thinking about, all the, the, the situations that you, that you worry about, the things that may happen in the future that you dread, the things that have happened in the past that you regret, the things that are happening now that you worry about, you know, all those things, when Jesus comes, they will all be forgotten. In Isaiah chapter 
65, the prophet says, for behold, I create new heavens and a new earth, and the former things will not be remembered or come to mind. But be glad and rejoice forever in what I create, for behold, I create Jerusalem for rejoicing and her people for gladness. Think about this. Remember I said a little while back in my lesson tonight, when we get to heaven, we're not going to be worried about, hey, God, what, whatever happened, you know, did they drown or did, whatever happened to the body or why did this happen to me and how could I have done better? We're, we're not going to be we're interested in those things. Why am I sure of that? Because Isaiah says, and I repeat, for behold, I create new heavens and a new earth and the former things will not be remembered or even come to mind. As Isaiah says, heaven will not be for remembering, but it will be for rejoicing all in the eternal now. And so our task now is to stand fast in faith, not to figure everything out or to measure God's justice to determine if what's happening is fair or not fair. Don't, don't go looking for the return. Don't, don't worry about its coming. All of this is wasted energy. When I see the amount of ink spilled online, if you wish, uh, kind of a mixed metaphor there. But anyways, when I see you know, all the talk that goes on uh, in, on various websites about when the end is going to be and uh, make sure you see you know, all the signs of the end, all that, wasted, all that wasted energy. Paul tells us that we will all be changed into internal glorious beings and it will be done in the twinkling of an eye. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, 52. From the state of death in sleep, or from a steady normal life lived faithfully, or from the middle of some crisis where all you can do is to stand fast in faith while everything is whirling about you, from one of these states, too fast to observe it or comment on it or feel it, transformed into a new creature with a body fit for an eternal joyful experience in the presence of God, never to sin, never to remember, and never to regret ever, ever again. This is the true and living hope that all Christians have, no matter what condition they find themselves in at the present time. This would have been the answer to Job's question and the end of his crisis had he known what we now know in Christ Jesus. The answer to Job, one day Job, in the twinkling of an eye, it'll all change. The good news for Job is that he will be rejoicing with all the faithful for the very same reason when Jesus comes to bring us together as the celestial church. And all the trials and all the sorrows will no longer have memory. It'll all be forgotten. We will have no interest in knowing anything of the past. We will only be interested in the eternal now. And so praise God and glory to Christ through the spirit for this wonderful promise. Amen. Okay, so that's our lesson for this time. Life lessons from Job. I said that uh, uh, one good exercise to be doing at the end of this lesson would be to share some of the lessons that you may have uh, you know, thought of as we studied uh, with Job. And so um, after the end of this uh, video, uh, I leave you to um, uh, share uh, those uh, stories, those lessons uh, among yourselves. Next week, our last lesson 
uh, in this series on Job and uh, we will be comparing the um, uh, way uh, that a Christian uh, mourns uh, death, uh, you know, uh, the way a Christian grieves uh, in comparison to the way uh, that people in the world uh, without faith have been taught to grieve. And we will compare these two experiences in order to close out our, uh, our series on the book of Job. So thank you for your attention and we will see you next time if the Lord is willing. God bless you.